I'm delighted that you're here in person. I want to welcome in those that are joining us online, our YouTube channel, the Bible study Uncharted. We're studying the life of David, and I promise you we're going to get to the life of David. We're going to get there. But when we, uh, last week, when we studied 1 Samuel chapter 12, that's where we were last week, there is this uh, event that happens. It's a uh, in your Bibles, it's uh, a little, the little subtitle in, uh, before chapter uh, 12 of 1 Samuel in my Bible, which, by the way, those aren't inspired. That's just an editor trying to help you know what's in your Bible. It says, mine says, Samuel's farewell speech, right? So uh, it's this event where Samuel's no longer functioning as the leader of Israel because they have anointed a king. They've anointed King Saul. Now, don't be confused. This isn't like uh, American politics where one president is in and another president is out. There is a long, uh, there are years actually of overlap between Samuel and Saul. And Israel's never had a king before. And quite honestly, Saul doesn't really know what a king does. So after he's anointed, he goes back home to the family farm and goes back to work, literally. Uh, it won't be until the, there's an attack on the land that he starts to function like a king. So it's Saul, it's Samuel's farewell address, but it's not. He's going to be around and you're going to see that he plays very prominently uh, in the demise of Saul and in the anointing of David in the days to come. But in this address in 1 Samuel 12, Samuel says to the people, you blew it. You had a king. You had Jesus as your king. God was your king. And then you just asked for a human to be your king. And you have sinned. And they, they've heard him say this before. He sounds like an old record, an old recording. He just says the same thing every time. And so they don't really listen. So on this occasion, he says, I'm going to prove to you that you have sinned. Today is the first day of harvest. Everybody had their wheat. It was all, all ready to come in. And then uh, Samuel prayed, and God sent a lightning storm, he sent a thunderstorm, and it demolished the crop. It demolished the crop, and the storm was of such uh, fierceness that the people then say to Samuel at this moment, pray to God for us that we don't die. We realize we've sinned. We've sinned in asking for a king. We now, now we know it. Please pray that we don't die. And so I want to I want to take that I want to take that exclamation. I want to take that that uh, that emotion. I hope it's when you read First Samuel. I don't know that it's real repentance, but they sure don't want to die in this lightning storm. Please pray that we don't die. And I want to talk with you a little bit about two subjects that sometimes you hear of, sometimes people talk about, but they often don't know what they mean or what they are. And the two subjects are the sin unto death and the unpardonable sin, all right? So they're, they're, they're completely different. They're not the same thing. The unpardonable sin, maybe you've heard of that phrase, but you're like, I don't know what that is. I hope I don't commit it because who, who doesn't want to be pardoned? and the sin unto death. So I want to start in Matthew chapter 12. That's all we're going to do of 1 Samuel uh, 12 today. I want to turn to Matthew chapter 12. If you uh, are with us on Sunday mornings, my, my teachings on Sunday mornings have been revolutionary faith. We started with these, uh, after the 400 silent years between Malachi and Matthew, we have the teachings of Jesus. And the, teaching, uh, the teachings of Jesus are are the first of this kind of teachings on the whole planet. You can go back before Jesus, you can go back to the days of Moses, you can go back to earlier days, but you'll never find anything like the teachings of Jesus. The scripture says, like the last verse of Matthew 7, that when the people heard the teachings of Jesus, they were astonished. And they said, no one's ever taught like this. And so what Jesus was teaching was the scriptures. He was teaching the Old Testament, but they never heard the Old Testament taught that way. The Old Testament had always been taught to them as a, as a rigid, legalistic, uh, 
a, mecha, a human mechanism of self-righteousness. And that wasn't the purpose of the teaching at all. Paul would later say, God gave us the law, not that we would live by the law, but that the law would expose our sin and we would turn to God and realize, I can't live by the law. Not, not one of us can keep the law. James would write in the New Testament, if you, if you violate the law in one place, you, you violated all of the law. The only way to get to heaven would be to be perfect. And that's why God sent Jesus. Jesus comes and he's perfect. He fulfills the law in every way. Well, these revolutionary teachings that we've been studying on Sundays, we write through Matthew 11. If you were to read those, you would come to Matthew 12 next. Now, Matthew 12 is a story of Jesus who casting out demons, and this is how it goes. Matthew 12, verse 22. Matthew 12, verse 22. Then a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him and Jesus healed him. This is, this is all it says. It's just, it's just given that much. Like, like, like for Jesus, it's nothing. It's, this is the way you and I would say, I'd say, I, I ordered at McDonald's, I pulled up to the window and they gave me a Big Mac. Uh, it's, it's, there's nothing more to it. We just read it. And Jesus is doing this all the time. You realize you, you and I have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We know the stories that are recorded for us, but there were many, many more that were not recorded. John said, uh, if we recorded everything Jesus did there, the, and the sky were a scroll, there wouldn't be enough space. So that's all we know, the, that he healed him. And so the man spoke and he saw in verse 23, and all the people were amazed. And they ask, can this be the son of David? Now they're not asking, do you think he's of the lineage of David? The son of David is a messianic title. When they say, can Jesus be the son of David? What they're, what they're asking is, is this the Messiah? Is this the one we've always heard about? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, now imagine he casts out a demon, guy couldn't see, couldn't talk, then he could do both. The average, normal, everyday, uneducated layman in Israel says, wow, maybe this is the Messiah. The most educated, most religious, the most self-righteous, the Pharisees said, it's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. So Jesus casts out a demon, <coughs> And there are immediately two different conclusions. Immediately, one group says, I, I, I think this might be the Messiah. And the other group says, well, you know, the reason he, he can do this is he's empowered by Satan himself. Beelzebub empowers him. Verse 25, Jesus knowing their thoughts. Just stop right there for a second. Do you know that he knows your thoughts? See, you can fool me. You can fool the people around you. You could be faking your faith and you could trick me. You cannot fool God. God's not tricked. He's not mocked. He's not fooled. He knows your thoughts. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided its, against itself is laid waste. No city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan were to cast out Satan, well, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? It's, it, you, you and I as... Gentiles 2,000 years removed from this conversation do not realize the uh, harshness of this statement, the offense of this statement. If, if, if I've cast out by Beelzebub, then how, who do your sons cast them out by? Therefore, they will be your judges. He goes on in verse 28, but if but if, if it's by the Spirit, capital S, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. If by the Holy Spirit of God that I cast out demons, 
then you have come to the exact wrong conclusion. Now, they didn't come to this conclusion because of what, ha- what they saw. They, this was a predetermined conclusion for them. They didn't, be- they didn't want Jesus. They didn't believe in Jesus. Jesus threatened their, their uh, income. He threatened their power. He threatened their position. They, they were full of their self-righteousness. They had already concluded this before Jesus ever did the miracle. So he says, if I, verse 28, if this is by the Holy Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, let me stop and explain this part as well. I think this is really important. So when Jesus is here on earth, he's completely son of God, right? Everybody, nod your heads. Are we all in agreement? He's 100% completely God. He's the son of God. But he is also, at the exact same time, we can't fathom this, but the Bible teaches it, He is 100% man. Are you with me on this? You get it? Now, if you nod your heads, that doesn't mean you understand it. It means you believe it. I don't understand it. He's 100% God. He's 100% human. He's both at the same time. So this is what Jesus does. This is important for you to get this. When Jesus lived his life as a human, everything that Jesus did He did not with his divine prerogatives as the son of God. In fact, Philippians chapter two teaches us that he emptied himself of his divine prerogative. It's as if when he left heaven to become a human, he left that there. When he became a human, he did it just like you did. He he came out of his mother's womb. He was a baby. He grew up as a little boy. He he did life like you did life. So when we talk about Jesus being perfect, sometimes we, we go like, well, of course, he was the son of God. His perfection was attained by walking in the Holy Spirit. Everything that Jesus did, he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the reason he did it that way is so that Satan or someone else couldn't say, well, he cheated. Of course he was perfect. He's God. He can't help but be perfect. He's God. He didn't use his God powers to be perfect. He used the Holy Spirit to be perfect. So all the admonitions of the New Testament that tell you to be filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized with the Holy Spirit and anointed with the Holy Spirit and walk in the Holy Spirit... That's what you're expected to do. That's how Jesus did it. So you can't dismiss yourself and go like, well, I can't. of course I'm not perfect. I'm not God. Uh-uh, that's not how Jesus was perfect. Jesus overcame temptation by the Spirit. When you go back to Matthew chapter 4 and he goes into the wilderness for temptation, the Scripture says he was led by the Spirit. Here he tells us that he cast out a demon. Did he use his divine prerogative to do that? No. He did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's important now because of what comes next. Verse 28, I'm going to reread it now continuing. But if it is by the Holy Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. How how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he can plunder his house. So he's he's still talking about this thing. You can't, you, you don't cast out demons with demonic power. You have to bind demons to take their power from them. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, and now we come to this problematic passage that people have struggled with for years and years. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and every blasphemy will be forgiven people. But the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks the word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. This phrase here, that, that, that this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven has given way to the phrase, the unpardonable, the unforgiven sin. So what is the unforgivable sin? sin that Jesus is talking about. Jesus is 
strangely a little vague here with us. We, wanna, we want him to be very, very specific because we all go like, I don't want to commit that sin, whatever that is. So let's be clear about some things. First of all, this sin isn't robbing banks. That's, that's not the, the, the unforgivable sin. The, this sin isn't a lying. That's not the unforgivable sin. It's, it's not one of the Ten Commandments. You're like, oh, make sure you don't commit that one. There were uh, many years, it started in the Middle Ages, and uh, it was kind of uh, carried along in Catholicism for many years, that uh, suicide was thought to be the unpardonable sin. That if you took your own life, that was a cardinal sin. That one couldn't be forgiven, but the Bible doesn't speak to that anywhere at any time. And what, what you discover in this study is something quite very, very different from it being any one particular sin. Jesus brings something to bear here that's really, really important, and that is that he makes a distinction between sin that could be committed against himself he says that can be forgiven, and sin that is, that is uh, perpetuated against the Holy Spirit, which he says cannot be forgiven. So, so we got to stop here a little bit, and we got to think about the Trinity, right? So with the Trinity, you have uh, God the Father, you have God the Son, and you have God the Holy Spirit. Which one is the highest form of God? When you're a kid, you think, oh, God the Father. God the Father is the highest form of God. But that, in, that becomes heresy in itself because it creates this hierarchy. Like there's God, because we normally say Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Some of us kind of grow up thinking, well, that's the order of, of importance or priority, that it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the three parts, the three personalities of God are all God, completely God, and all co-equal. And when you find the scripture, you find that each one glorifies the other. Jesus says, I come to glorify the Father. He says, I don't say anything except what the Father tells me to say. When we read about the Spirit, the Spirit says, the Spirit glorifies the Son. The Spirit doesn't speak of his own, but only what the Son tells him to say. We, we find this co-equalness in the Trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So why then would Jesus say, you can basically, he didn't say this, but you can sin against the Father, that'll be forgiven. You can sin against the Son, that'll be forgiven. But if you sin against the Holy Spirit, that's not gonna be forgiven. Why would he say that? It sounds like it elevates the Holy Spirit to the highest part of God, and the Father and Son are somewhat lesser than the Holy Spirit because you can sin against them, but you can't sin against the Holy Spirit. And that leads you into all kinds of wrong thinking. Here's what Jesus is talking about. God loves us, all of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He loves us with an everlasting love. The story of his love to us and for us as we have it in the Old Testament begins with God the Father. This, this relationship that, that Israel has with God in 1 Samuel 12, which we read, God says, I'm your king. You don't need a king. I'm your king. And God the Father is their king, and this is, this is what they reject. You can reject God the Father at that point because God's still at work in the world. What work is? is he going to do? Well, we know because we're in terms of history, we're on this side of it. God sends his son. God sends his son. It was always his plan, but God sends his son. And what does the world do? The world rejects his son. The world nails Jesus to the cross. Here in Matthew 12 is a specific story of the rejection of Jesus. Oh, you're not the Messiah. You, you do miracles by the power of Beelzebub. It's a, it's a complete rejection of Jesus. But God's not done working yet. God will. Jesus talks about this at length. 
uh, John 14, 15, 16, even 17 and 18. He says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you a teacher. I'm going to send you a guide. He's going he's to say whatever I instruct him to say. He will live in you. He will be with you. You can walk in the Spirit. You don't have to walk in the flesh. Without me, you can do nothing. You've got to have the Holy Spirit. I'm going to depart from you, he says in John 14. And it's good that I go away. There would be no disciple that would think, no, no, that's not good. They would all go like, we don't want to lose you. It's better that I go away, Jesus says. Why? Because he took on himself the limitations of a man. He was in a, he, Jesus could only be in one place at one time. He was in a body. He, he was in flesh. God in flesh dwelt among us. But when he returned to heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit. Each believer in this room when we say our final amen and we all get in our cars and we go all kinds of different directions, who gets to take the Holy Spirit? The answer is every one of us. Each of us have the Holy Spirit of God. And so the Holy Spirit of God is at work in the world in a different way than he's ever was before. So the Father was at work in the world, then the Son came to the world, he, he did his work in the world, and then the Holy Spirit. If you reject the work of God through the third person of God, the Holy Spirit, which part of God is coming next? There, there isn't any more. There's no fourth person of the Godhead. It's only three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is not teaching that the Holy Spirit is holier than the Father or the Son. That's why when you sin against the Holy Spirit, you can't be forgiven. Jesus is just saying the work of God is now complete. If you rejected the Father, the Son was to come. If you rejected the Son, the Holy Spirit's to come. If you reject the Holy Spirit, you've now rejected all of God. And there's no more God coming. He, he, he comes. He comes back as judge. And so a rejection of the Holy Spirit means there's, there's nothing else left for you. So let me see if I can be really clear about this. The unpardonable sin is not a sin that a believer can commit. No, no one who's given their life to Christ can commit the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is not a specific sin. It's not, a, it's not, a, uh, it's not episodic or incidental. It's not a, I robbed banks, I pushed a little old lady under the train tracks. That's not, that's not what is unpardonable, it, not even suicide. What can't be forgiven is my unbelief. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that God, God the Father, I don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and I don't believe this is the work of the God through this Holy Spirit. So now, it's my unbelief. And of course, unbelief isn't forgiven because it's unbelief. What does it take? To be forgiven, it takes repentance and faith. So without repentance and faith, you're in an unsavable, an unredeemable, an unforgivable position. And so it's not forgiven. Not forgiven because God doesn't want to love you and forgive you? No. Not forgiven because you have rejected God yet again. Now, the unpardonable sin is also an invisible line. So, so first of all, no believer can commit the unpardonable sin, but which unbelievers have, for, have committed the unpardonable sin? The answer is, you don't know and I don't know. It's it's an invisible line of the rejection of God. In Matthew chapter 12, because we have Jesus, we actually know when these particular Pharisees cross the invisible line. They say, oh, he didn't cast out demons by the power of God. This isn't the power of God. They can see it, it's clear. All the people are like, oh, it looks like the power of God to me. They declare it's not. And they're 
rejection of that, Jesus declares to them, is, oh, you've, that, you've crossed the line. But it's invisible. So you and I don't know among our family members and friends and neighbors who right now are actively rejecting God. They don't want to give their lives to God. They don't really believe in a God. We, we, we don't know what that looks like. It's, it's an invisible line for them. I, I will say there are a couple of things that tend it. There are a couple of things that attend the unpardonable sin. One of them is the person who has now moved across that line and is not going to be saved, they feel no conviction of the Holy Spirit at all. Because God doesn't, he doesn't waste his Holy Spirit on them. They, they've now moved to a, to a place of unbelief that, that they have chosen they're not going to be saved. So, so there's no compunction for them. There's no, there's no conscience for them. There's no, uh, um, they're not worried. They're not worried about hell. Um, you know, I saw, was it last year in the Super Bowl, a commercial, the atheist who said, hey, I'm going to hell. I'm gladly going to go to hell with you. Come and join me. That's a joke for them because they, they've moved past any of that. If you, when you sin, if you feel the Holy Spirit of God saying to you, hey, 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 hey what are you doing there? You haven't, you haven't committed the unpardonable sin. In fact, the scripture says, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. So when you get a spiritual spanking, next time you say, thank you, Jesus, right? That, that means he's still working in your life. He's still pointing out to you, no, don't go that way, go this way. This is right, that's wrong. And if you're struggling with that, the struggle is the indication that the, the Holy Spirit in you is fighting the, the old flesh in you. The one who's committed the unpardonable sin, there's no struggle in their lives. No struggle in their lives. They're not... No compunction here. To hear a Bible study like this, it just causes them to roll their eyes. This would be a complete waste of time for them. That's the one who's committed the unpardonable sin. Now, the part that I'm going to say next is completely my own opinion. I always try to be clear about that in terms of Bible study. I think as we go into the end times, I think there's going to be more and more and more and more people who commit the unpardonable sin. I think, I think, we're, I think we're going to have more in our culture who, who just, uh, like the Pharisees, see right and righteousness. They see God's word. They see truth, and they call it false, and they call it myth. They see the truth of God, and they call it hate speech. And so I think you're going to see, this, this is the part that's my opinion, I think you're going to see more and more people that we would think, I think that if that's crossing the line. So that's, the unpardonable sin that Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 12. That is not a sin unto death. Will you join me in 1 John chapter 5? There is a different description of a different kind of sin, and it has a different name. The first name that we've studied is an unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is committed by unbelievers. It's the sin of unbelief. It's the complete and total rejection of God the Father, God the Son, and once God the Holy Spirit is rejected, then there's nowhere else to go for them. They have just gone too far, and they are beyond that redemption of God. Not by God's choice, but by their choice. God still has this everlasting love. Jesus, when he went to the cross, died for every person on the planet. But they've rejected that, and it has sealed their uh, eternal separation from God. A sin unto death, and if you've never heard it, we're going to read the only place that it appears in all of the Bible. This is, why, this is also why it's so hard for us to understand. And John's language is also vague, like the language of the Lord. Let's begin in verse 13, just because I love verse 13. Verse 13 should be underlined in your Bible and starred and marked and memorized. It says, I write these things to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may hope that one day you maybe, quite possibly, could go to heaven if things, every, things work out right. Is that what your Bible says? No, it does not. 
The idea that people just, well, I hope I'm gonna to go to heaven when I die is not biblical. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may, say it out loud, know. K-N-O-W, know it. You're, you're supposed to know it. Every now and then when I tell somebody, particularly I'm talking to an unbeliever about eternity, and I say, I know that I'm gonna to go to heaven, they look at me like I'm arrogant, like I, like I think I'm going by my own self-righteousness. I know I'm going to heaven. Be clear. I know I'm going to heaven, but I am not going to heaven because of my self-righteousness. If you knew anything about me, that'd be funny. I, I know that I'm going to heaven because God says, if we trust in the name of his son, the power of the name of his son, we can know it. So he says, I write these things to you so that you can know that you have eternal life. If you're one who wakes up every morning and go, oh, 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 I hope I'm safe today. This is the verse you need to memorize right here. This is the verse you need to live with so that you can know that you have eternal life. And verse 14, and this is the confidence. So uh, uh, John's doubling down. He didn't accidentally say that. Here's the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, that's a, that's a parenthetical statement, but he just is like, oh, I, I want a million dollars. I want a Corvette. That's not what he's talking about. If you ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know, because he's talking about things you can know, if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If he hears us, then he answers us, is what he's saying. He's not, he isn't, God doesn't hear us and then go, um, uh, no, he hears us and answers us. And so we can know that. Then in verse 16, we come to this difficult part of the passage. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. This is to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not, I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that doesn't lead to death. That's all we got. So we got, we got to take the rest of scripture because when you have a hard passage, do I just, now do I just get up and I give it my own interpretation? No, let the Bible interpret the Bible. So we take the rest of the Bible and we, we can take f what we know and it helps us with a passage that seems like it's difficult to understand. Now, first thing we know is that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. So when uh, the scripture says that sin leads to death, it's talking about our spiritual death. When God said to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the moment that you eat of that tree, you will die. And Eve eats, and she gives it to Adam, and he eats, and they don't die. So is God a liar? Well, you have to think through what's going on there. They didn't die physically, they didn't die mentally, they didn't die emotionally, but they most certainly died. They died spiritually. The real you is the spiritual part of you, the soul of who you are. The real you isn't your body, say amen. As our bodies age and get older and are infirmed, who wants that to be your real you? That's not your real you. In fact, death is uh, an evidence of God's love. If you live forever in that body that you've got as it aged, anybody want to do that? No, I, this morning I almost passed out tying my boots. No, I, no, you don't want to do that. You, you, are you at the stage right now when you, you just, you got, you got to go downstairs to get something in your house and you and the wife flip on who has to go down and get it. When you go down to get it, you stop halfway to get your breath on your way back up. No, you don't want to be in that body forever. That body's not the real you. The real you is your soul. It's your spirit. And in the moment that Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in the moment that they sinned, spiritually they were dead. In your case, and in my case, God didn't have to wait for us, to, didn't have to wait for you to sin. You certainly sinned as soon as you had the opportunity. But he didn't have to wait for that because you are the product of sinners. Your mom was a sinner and your dad was a sinner. And when sinners have babies, do they have little saints? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Dogs have dogs, cats have cats, sinners have sinners. 
So, so there, didn't, there wasn't some divine miracle and now your grandkids are saints. Uh-uh. They're sinners too. Can I just add sinners who need spankings? Can I just say that out loud? Um, so, so this is a universal biblical principle that sin brings death. So when we read John, who, by the way, was the writer of John chapter 3, where Nicodemus says, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus says, you got to be born again. Why does he have to be born again? Because he's spiritually dead. That's why he has to be born again. So the, so the salvation is called a new birth. It's a new life. Why do you need a new life? Because the old one is dead. John writes that. So John's not confused in his own theology here, but he's not talking about the spirit here. He's talking about the body. When he says, if you see your brother committing a sin not leading to death, he's talking about physical death, not spiritual death. He says, to the, there, you can commit sins and, and you don't die that moment that you commit the sin. There, there is a sin that leads to death. I don't think you should pray for that. Verse 17, all wrongdoing is sin, but there are sins that don't lead to physical death is what he's talking about. He's not talking about spiritual death. Every sin leads to spiritual death. That is a biblical principle from the beginning of time. Moses says to the, to the half tribe that won't go across the Jordan to fight for their brothers, he says, if you don't go across and fight for your brothers, beware, your sin will find you out. This is all the way in the Old Testament. We discover these principles of sin. So he's talking about a, a physical death. And John is alluding to something that if, we, if we're Bible students, we already know. There are some times and places where God, by his own perfect justice, takes the life of a believer. The sin unto death is only committed by believers. Takes the life of a believer because of the corruption, the compromise, the damage that it will do to the church. Now let's do, a little, let's do a little comparisons here, shall we? The unpardonable sin, Matthew chapter 12, is a sin that only unbelievers can commit. Only unbelievers can commit the unforgivable sin. They have rejected God. The sin unto death, look at, look at John's verbiage. If any, verse 16, if anyone sees a brother commit this, it's, it's generic, it'd be brother or sister, He's talking about believers. So now we're talking about believers. And if believers commit a sin that is going to be, by God's own evaluation, damaging to his work, he has, and he does, bring them home. It's just their physical death happens just like that. Now, once again, let me tell you, this isn't any particular sin. This isn't, a, this isn't a robbery or a lie or a gossip. This is, in this sense, it's like the unpardonable sin. It's not any one particular sin. It is the, it's the, the damage of it. It's the hurtfulness of it that becomes important at that sense. So hold your place there. We'll come back to it. Turn with me to Acts chapter 5. So once again, we've got the scriptures. We'll, we're going to let the scriptures interpret the scriptures. And what we have in Acts chapter 5 is uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Acts is next. Acts chapter 5 is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And it is a story of a couple who commit the sin unto death. And because we have this story, now we're going to have some ability to understand what the sin unto death is. Here's how the story goes. Acts chapter five, verse one. There was a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira. 
They sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, we would read this full knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds, and he only brought a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, the reason that they did this is because in Acts chapter 4, look at verse 34, Acts chapter 4, verse 34, it says, There was not a single needy person among the church. And for as many as were owners of lands or houses, they sold them and they brought the proceeds of what was sold and they laid them at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as they had a need. Now, this is why they had to do that at that juncture. You might sometimes people go like, well, the church of today isn't like the New Testament church. In the New Testament church, it was, it was communal. Everybody sold what they had and they all brought it together. That's not how they lived on a regular basis, but they had a particular problem right here. The particular problem was that they had all of these people in Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost. And the church, which was about 120 people, that was the upper room uh, attendance, 120 people on the day of Pentecost became 3,120 people. And the 3,000 that were saved didn't live in Jerusalem. They didn't have jobs in Jerusalem. They didn't have houses in Jerusalem. They were pilgrims who were there for the Passover. They would start with the Passover and they would stay all through the days of unleavened bread and they would stay all the way to Pentecost which was 50 days later. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached and 3,000 were saved. You read the very next chapter, you read a whole bunch more were saved. And then pretty soon, uh, Luke, the writer of Acts, says on another occasion, 5,000 were saved. So this group that lives in Jerusalem, that's like 120, now have maybe upwards of 10,000 new believers who don't live in Jerusalem, and don't have jobs in Jerusalem, but they're discipling them before they send them back out to all the ends of the earth. And so they have a particular need. It's a, it's a humanitarian need. So this isn't the everyday regular church life that we're reading about. This is, this is extraordinary circumstances. And so people who live in Jerusalem are selling land and selling uh, some things that they have, houses, and they are getting the money so that they can house and feed all these people that they're discipling who they're going to send to the ends of the world. And one of them, verse 36, was named Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas. That was his nickname. He's going to be called Barnabas for the, all the rest of the New Testament. And that's a nickname which means son of encouragement. He was a Levite. He was a native of Cyprus. He sold a field that belonged to him and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. And no doubt, when we get to chapter five, Ananias and Sapphira see this and they see Joseph was so, he, he was so blessed by the apostles. They even gave him a nickname. And then last Sunday, he was on the stage. Did you see him? Standing right next to Peter. And so they have now a different motive. Their motive isn't to care for the 10,000 uh, displaced believers at Pentecost. Their motive is, we want, we, want to be, we want to be noted. We want to be on the stage like Barnabas. We want, we want everybody to say, here's Ananias and Sapphira. They sold their land and, and we're going to give them nicknames. Wife and husband of encouragement. And, hey, and everybody go like, they're the awesome. So they got the wrong motives. And then they also get to talk to each other and they're like, you know what? Oh, pff, that's a lot of money. We sell that property. It's a lot, that's a lot of money. Let's just do this. Let's sell the property. We'll tell them that we sold it, we'll tell them that we sold it for 100,000, even though we sold it for 200,000. And then everybody will, everybody will think we're like Barnabas, but we'll have just a little left, right? So that's, that's what you're reading, okay? It's a, it's a false motive and it's a lie. They didn't, they didn't sell their property for what they said they did. So verse two says they came and they brought only a part of it and they laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter says in verse three, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? 
Now this is very clear. You, got, you need to read this so you understand it, so you understand what the sin is. He says, while it remained unsold, wasn't it your own? What Peter's saying is, you didn't have to sell it and bring it. Nobody would have thought any less of you. You didn't have to sell it. And then he says, and uh, after it was sold, wasn't it your disposal? When you sold it, you didn't have to bring any of it to us. You could have sold it and said, I sold it for 200,000, I'm only bringing you 100,000. Sapphira and I really feel like we need to keep that back. He says, you, you could have done all of that and nothing would be wrong. That's what he's saying. Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but you lied to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down stone cold dead. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like much of a sin to me. I, I, there, there are other worse sins in the Bible that I can take you to right now. I can take you to some murders, to some genocide. I can take you to rape. I can take you to the cover up of that. I can take you to scriptures that I, I think those would be far worse sins than fudging a little bit about how much you sold your property for. Why is this a sin unto death? Because of the character of what it is. You're lying to God. You're going to play this God game. I just want to be on the stage with Barnabas and I want everybody to think I'm something that I'm not. There's not a place for that in the church. Later, the Apostle Paul would say, have you noticed in the church life, he calls those of us who aren't very smart and we're not rich and we're not well-educated and we're just kind of humble? Have you ever noticed that about church life? Unless I'm wrong, is there a billionaire in the room? Could I see your hand? I'd really like to know if there is. <laughs> no, it's not that maybe some billionaire somewhere is not a save, but mostly in church life, we're just regular folk. And when church life starts to take on the world, it's so serious, as in this case, that this is a sin unto death. This isn't the only sin unto death in this passage. By the way, it says, and a great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men, verse six, rose and wrapped him and carried him out to be buried. After an interval of about three hours, uh, Sapphira came in looking for Ananias. And she didn't know what happened. So Peter said, tell me, did you sell the land for so much? And she lies too. And she goes, yeah, that's how much we sold it for. And Peter says, how is it that you have agreed? We would use the word conspired. You've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down stone cold dead. When the young man came out, imagine what you've been doing all afternoon. You got you got you, you, you dig a grave by hand. Six six takes you several hours. You get it done. You get back only to discover Mrs. Ananias is dead, and you got to do that again. Verse eleven says, "And great fear came upon the whole church." Um. This isn't really the only occasion of this. Uh, when Paul writes to Timothy, he writes about uh, Alexander and Hymenaeus, who he says, I've given over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Um, in, uh, in Acts chapter uh, 12, Peter's in Samaria, and a guy named Simon, who was a magician, uh, sees his power and he offers Peter money so that he can have the power of the Holy Spirit. And Peter says, you, you, you're, you'll die with your money. And then Simon says, oh, 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 pray for me that I don't die. Pray for me that I don't die. And, and then the Bible doesn't tell us what happens next. So here's, here's what I want to say to you. The unpardonable sin is completely different from the sin unto death. The unpardonable sin is unbelievers who have concreted themselves in a position of unbelief. And, and, and so they've, they've 
cross that line. Sin unto death is not a sin that unbelievers commit. Sin unto death is a sin that believers commit that has the ability to be a cancer in the church, has the ability to hurt the church, to compromise the church, to water down the church. Ananias and Sapphira weren't the last believers that died. When Paul writes the Corinthian church about their their failure to partake of the Lord's Supper in a holy way. And what they had started doing was, whenever, in Corinth, whenever they had the Lord's Supper, they also had potluck, right? So, so potlucks and the Lord's Suppers at Emmanuel are two different events. They're both wonderful. Uh, by the way, we're gonna have Lord's Supper this Sunday. Some of you always ask, when are we having the Lord's Supper next? This Sunday. But they're two different things. So they were doing potluck and then the Lord's Supper right after that. Well, the rich people uh, would bring really wonderful food to the potluck. The poor people didn't bring anything. And then the poor people found out when they were potluck, and they not only didn't bring anything, they came and would eat everything that they could. So we, they had this division between the, the rich and the poor, the eaters and the, the you know, the kind of the, the formal part of that. So the rich people started spreading the word. We'll tell everybody that we meet at 630, but we'll really meet at six. That way we can eat before the poor people get here and knock out all the food. This is exactly what was happening. And the Apostle Paul said, you, 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 you're compromising the love and the fellowship of the Lord's Supper. And then he says, this is uh, 1 Corinthians 11. And because of this, some of you are sick and some of you are ill and some of you have died. You've, you've partaken of the Lord's Supper unworthily. It's a, the, they, had, they, were, they were corrupting their church. They were damaging their church. And so in order to keep the church pure, God protects that. The person who commits the sin unto death, do they go to hell? No, they go to heaven. They're believers. They go to heaven. But the purpose is so that the rest of us would look at that and go, I ain't doing that. God's serious about church. He's not playing church. He's serious about church. And we are to be reminded with reverence and being sober-minded and, and maybe even the fear of the Lord, we, we better not mess up, church, because there is a sin unto death. The last phrase is, and I'm out of time, John says, if you see your brother or sister commit a sin, it's not unto death, you should pray for them. You should pray that they will come to their senses and repentance and come back. And then he says, if you see them commit a sin and you think they should die for that, he goes, don't pray that way. Dear Lord, please just kill old John Doe. He's just a despicable person. No, what John, John says, I don't pray that way. Pray that God brings us to repentance and faith. That's what he's talking about. I hope... You have taken two, they're, they're completely different things, unpardonable sin and sin unto death, but I hope today you leave and go like, okay, I think I get that. I think I understand what those things are and what they're about.